Hello, I'm Stephen Mildenhall, and in this video we're going to be discussing my book, Pricing Insurance Risk Theory and Practice, that I wrote with John Major and was recently published by Wiley. Uh, the QR code on this slide will take you to a PDF of the presentation. So when you write a book, there's three questions you really should answer. One is, what is it about? Two is, why did you write it? And three is, what can you learn from reading it? What is this book about? Well, it's about putting a price on risk and uncertainty related to property casualty insurance contracts. So things like a house insurance, car, plane liability insurance, and so forth. And in actuarial terms, it's about going from a loss cost or a pure premium to a technical premium net of expenses. Insurance risk is a particular class of risk that is pure in the sense that it only deals with downside. There's no upside. It's not like an asset risk where you can gain or lose. And it's diversifiable in the sense that if you have a large number of these risks, they can offset one against another and produce a more um, stable outcome. So the book is really about the insurance analog of asset risk return theories, but for diversifiable risks. And it's clear that insurance requires a different theory because, for example, the capital asset pricing model uh, would say there is no charge for diversifiable risk. So it would say all insurance contracts should be written with no uh, risk load at all. And moreover, those theories typically come up with what's called an additive pricing functional, which means that the price of a portfolio is equal to the sum of the prices of the parts. In a model like that, you have no role for an insurance company. So we clearly need a, a better theory here to allow insurance companies to exist and uh, to allow insurance contracts to be written with a positive risk load. Uh, so the second question, why did we write the book? And you may be thinking, if you know about insurance, most lines of business are written with fairly low uh, risk loads, maybe in the sort of five to 10% range. And it doesn't seem worth writing a whole book. And this is a 500 and odd page book around five to 10%. So I need to give you a bit of an explanation there. And the background is John and I uh, both worked for reinsurance brokers. And in, and in that role, we interacted with insurance company management who tend to be very risk aware and have quite a sophisticated view of risk. And we saw them struggling time and time again with catastrophe risk. So catastrophe, I'm going to call it cat risk, things like hurricanes or typhoons, earthquakes, winter storms, floods, and so forth. These are major events where the independence assumption uh, breaks down somewhat. And you can actually listen to execs struggling with this if you listen to some of the quarterly conference calls that people have after their earnings releases. The risk loads that get applied to pure cap business can range from two to five times expected loss. So rather than a 95% loss ratio, you're talking about a, a 50 down to a 20% loss ratio. So way, way more risk load than uh, expected loss cost in these types of business, showing that management really dislikes uh, the idea of, of catastrophe risk and making the risk load here the most material part of the premium. Cat risk is also a increasing part of all property lines. Uh, it drives market dislocation for the non-catastrophe parts of property, uh, and it can't be legislated away unlike a liability problem. You can't escape the weather. So understanding decision-making related to cap risk expressed through cap risk loads is an important motivating problem and was part of why uh, we, we wanted to write this book. And we both felt as we were working that uh, the literature or academic uh, community has spent a lot of time on this problem. And there had to be a good answer to it if only we had time enough to try and uh, understand what had been written. Uh, and we found that in fact, that was the case. There are very good answers there. I'm gonna describe some of them to you. Uh, but in terms of actuarial practice, we describe those as being known, but not widely known. And uh, one of the objectives of the book is to make some of these theoretical models more widely known and implemented in practice. Management then and, and actually struggle to find a, a good answer to the cat question. And I'd like to ask you a poll. I know we can't do a poll over a video like this, but just consider this question in your mind, jot down what you think the answer is. So which best describes the risk loads you expect to see for cat relative to non-cat exposed business? Do you think cat should have a significantly higher risk load, uh, a moderately higher risk load? The two businesses should have about the same risk load or cat should actually have a lower risk load than non-cat. So I'll just give you a moment to, to think about that and maybe commit to an answer, write, write something down on a piece of paper. Now, you can probably tell from my remarks that my expectation would be that most people probably say A or, or B, 
uh, maybe very few uh, would say C and hopefully no one would say D. And uh, I don't know where you, you came up, but uh, that would be the conventional wisdom, I think, amongst practicing actuaries. I want to give you now three highlights from the book that we'll expand on through the rest of the presentation. The first is that Adam Smith was way ahead of his time. Uh, and we'll, we begin with a quote from Adam Smith that I'll take you to in a moment. Secondly, here, it, it takes two risk measures actually to price. And if you're only dealing with one risk measure, you're missing an important ingredient and you're probably not gonna to get to the right answer. And then thirdly, in this first section, the cost of capital is not constant. And uh, that has a couple of dimensions to it, as we'll explain. Second group of ideas is, as I said, modern finance provides some very satisfying theoretical models to answer this question. And uh, we'll describe those, but show that they don't quite work in practice and they're can be a little hard to parameterize, so a little hard to use in practice as well. And then thirdly, uh, we'll talk about the need to allocate premium and not capital. This follows once we've decided the cost of capital is not constant. And in, to, in order to parameterize as thoroughly as possible, we should be bringing in financing and strategic decisions as well as uh, insurance premiums that we can see. So let's get started with whatever this, the, the theoretical answer that I promised is. Well, to be honest, it's not the answer, it's, it's an answer, right? So I'm gonna describe one answer here. There's other assumptions that you could make, but this is a very uh, satisfying uh, model in a, in a simple world um, as, I, as I will describe. And let's begin by seeing what Adam Smith said. I, I, I wondered as we were writing the book, hey, you know, Adam Smith often had a lot of good things to say about economics. What did he say about insurance? And if you go to the Wealth of Nations and you look up insurance, uh, you come up with this long quote uh, written in, in 1789. So 233 years ago, Adam Smith wrote that in order to make an insurance a trade at all, the common premium, and by common premium, he means average expected premium, must be sufficient to compensate for the common loss. So we must cover the expected loss to pay the expense of management and to afford such a profit as might have been drawn from an equal capital employed in any common trade. So Adam Smith is saying that insurance premium needs to be expected loss plus some cost of capital, which again, for, for 233 years ago, is a stunningly modern way of thinking about insurance pricing. So if we move to, let's try and translate that Adam Smith's model into a, a cost of capital uh, portfolio pricing model, in modern terms. And I should mention here, we're thinking of a very simple insurance company, a one period company comes into existence at time zero. It uh, sells policies, raises premium, uh, raises capital from investors. At time one, losses become known. It pays its losses, distributes its residual value to the investors. So we've got two uh, ingredients here. Well, we'll, we've got the loss distribution that uh, we're gonna be writing in this insurance company, plus an amount of assets, A, and a cost of capital rate, which I'm gonna call uh, EOTA. So a couple of observations. Because this company comes into existence at, at time zero, it's got no legacy assets uh, or liabilities, no reserves, for example. So its assets equal its premium plus its capital. So it gives us a way to, to think between premium uh, and capital. And then we need two risk measures that I mentioned. One is gonna determine that amount of assets that we need, A, and the other is gonna de determine the cost of the capital that we use. Uh, thirdly, we're going to assume that the amount of assets is exogenous. It's given by some regulator or rating agency, often in the US, uh, by a function uh, A of X. And you notice I here talk about it as determining assets as opposed to capital, um, because really it's the assets that are available to the company to pay claims that regulators worry about, not strictly the, the capital. If you were to write a bunch of policies at either a higher or lower premium, you would expect that your capital amount should vary according to your premium adequacy. That doesn't always happen in uh, the, the way the models get implemented in the real world, but in theory, that's how it should work. So we're going to have the regulator set the amount of assets rather than the amount of capital. We're back into uh, the amount of capital depending on the amount of premium. Fourthly, uh, we see this company is, is a limited liability insurance company. So actually you're pricing only up to the amount of assets you have. So you're pricing the minimum of X and A. We use that wedge notation there. 
uh, rather than the unlimited promises that you've made on your policies X. You cannot pay more uh, than the assets that you have available. If X is greater than A, then you just pay out A in some way to your policyholders and you default on the remainder. It's a limited liability insurance company. And so automatically from four, we see the price is going to be related to capital structure, uh, which was a long term goal of, of pricing. You read papers that were written, financial pricing papers that were written in the 80s and the early 90s. Getting a price related to capital structure was a, was a goal there. And you can see that this model uh, has that already. And in, in a way, this is sort of philosophically aligned with the Cummins uh, option pricing uh, models that were in vogue then. So what is the formula for our cost of capital premium? It's going to be per Adam Smith expected loss plus the cost of capital, which is a percentage rate times the amount of capital that you have. Uh, from item one there on the left, capital is equal to assets minus premium. So we get the second line. Uh, premium is expected loss plus uh, EOTA cost of capital times A minus P is the amount of capital. And at this point, we can do a few little uh, rearrangements. And I, I would recommend these to folks that are very handy. If you introduce a, a rate of risk discount, so one over one plus EOTA, and a rate of uh, discount D, EOTA over one plus EOTA. So these are analogous to the theory of interest, uh, you know, IV and D functions that hopefully you're all aware of. So V plus D equals one and D equals IV. Uh, we're really sort of moving money from, from the end of period to the, the beginning of period. And using those, you can see, um, you can rewrite your premium as the expected loss plus D, the rate of risk discount times A minus EL. So A minus EL is, is what we would call the shared liability. The policyholders should definitely pay the expected loss. The difference between assets and expected loss needs to be split between the policyholders and the investors. And we're saying the proportion D of it goes uh, to the policyholders. So the second equation is, is expressing premium as uh, expected loss plus risk margin. You can then rearrange it um, using the fact that D plus V equals one into total assets minus capital. So V times A minus EL uh, remember, the investors here are buying the residual value of the company, the amount that's left over after claims have been paid. The expected value of the residual is A minus E of L. And then V is the discount factor that investors apply to their expected value, reflecting the fact they're risk averse, that V will be less than one and they will pay slightly less than the expected value of the residual. So the uh, capital amount that they'll pay in will be V A minus EL. So the second equation there is, is using the fact that premium is assets minus capital. And then we can get a sort of nicely symmetric arrangement um, where we would write premium as VEL plus D, DA. Now this has a nice sort of um, behavioral uh, interpretation. Um, you can think of it as, so EL is, is the result of applying the expectation operator to the um, policy that you're pricing or the portfolio you're pricing. And in this case, A is the most losses you can possibly pay. And so that's, um, uh, that uh, is equal to the maximum value of the um, policies that you're actually pricing. So you can look at VEL plus DA and you can say, well, what that is, is it's the premium you get from an underwriter who is risk neutral and that underwriter would price the policies at their expected value, a proportion V of the time. And the underwriter is at, has absolutely the most catastrophic dire view of the world and prices things at the worst possible outcome, maximum, a proportion D of the time. Okay, so this premium formula is a weighted average of a risk neutral and a worst possible case uh, scenario. And that's gonna come back, we'll, we'll uh, see that again um, later on this uh, interpretation. Um, this, if you look at US rate filings, is essentially the method in use for um, in, in Computing a risk margin onto uh, premiums. There's, there's obviously a lot of calculations around uh, discounting and present value and so forth, but underlying it, this is how risk loads get added into premium in US rate filings. Now, so far we haven't talked about the, whether the cost of capital should be constant or whether it should vary. Um, if you go back and read the papers from the 80s and 90s, there was a clear expectation that the cost of capital should vary but how, okay? And so the quote here on the left, this is from Cummins's uh, Journal of Risk and Insurance Discounted Cash Flow 
uh, paper written in, the 19, written in 1990. And he says that the use of a company-wide cost of capital implicitly assumes that a new policy has the same risk return characteristics as the firm as a whole, and that this assumption may be questionable in multiple line companies. But he goes on to say that the error involved in trying to fine tune the cost of capital by line of business um, might be greater than any gain that you would get from it. And at the time people tried to estimate cost of capital by line using an underwriting beta uh, model, which was never terribly successful. So there was an expectation that the cost of capital should vary by line, um, but it was very hard to parameterize. And so people adopted this constant cost of capital across lines because of estimation problems. However, as soon as they'd adopted it, they found it to be an extremely convenient assumption to make. Um, you can do economic value added calculations. You can basically turn pricing into a capital allocation problem because each unit of capital you're saying should earn the same return. So there's a sort of dictionary between a capital allocation and a, and a pricing because the capital has the same cost. So I would say that your know, cost of capital was given up um, by, by uh, researchers with reluctance in their faces, but alacrity in their hearts, to, to sort of quote uh, uh, Mark Twain. Um, and, and Cummings you know, goes on, he, he does say that it's an important unresolved uh, issue that would be a fruitful topic for further research to try and get a cost of capital that vary by lines. And that's one of the things that's going to pop out of the model that we have uh, in here. Now, what was forgotten here was we, so by line is certainly one dimension that you can think of cost of capital varying. But another dimension is you can think of it as varying up and down the capital tower. So you have, you know, equity is the lowest priority of, uh, of financing, but you could have some bonds that were issued above that at higher priorities. And we know, from glance at the newspaper, that those bonds have a credit yield curve and their cost is manifestly not constant across capital layers or, or different priorities. So a AAA rated bond, AA, what have you, have different uh, credit spreads. Um, now, you could be forgiven for arguing, well, but we know from Miller Mogdiliani that the value of the firm is independent of its financing. So yes, there's, there's a credit yield curve there and all of this capital doesn't earn the same return, but in total, the total cost is gonna be the same. And so it doesn't matter. But what we're going to see is that the fi financing, the way you financed it and this varying of cost of capital by layer absolutely does matter for cost allocation. It's gonna be a big finding uh, that comes out of this presentation. All right, so let's move to modern uh, portfolio pricing. And, and by modern here, in the book, we divide everything into classical and modern. And we take the date for modern as, as starting in, in 1997, uh, which is the average publication date of three kind of watershed papers. The first was the Thinking Coherently um, paper that introduced coherent risk measures um, that was published in 97. The second was uh, Rich Phillips's multi-line pricing paper uh, that was published in 98. And the third was Sean Wang's Premium Density and Pricing by Layer paper uh, that was published in 96. So there's a sort of 97 is used as the, the beginning of the, the modern period. And the, the coherent revolution, if you will, um, put forth a sort of axiomatic approach to, to risk measures. And it said we should write down some desirable characteristics for risk measures and then um, try and find all the risk measures that satisfy those uh, uh, axioms and potentially work with, with those. And, and that has proven to be a very fruitful way to proceed. So what desirable properties uh, might we have for a pricing uh, functional? So this is gonna be something that takes a, a random variable X and it gives us this risk loaded uh, price for it. Well, the first property is that we, we would want it to be monotone. So if we've got two risks, X and Y, and if the outcome X is less than or equal to the outcome of Y in every single state of the world, then we would certainly hope that the premium for X should be less than or equal to the premium for Y. I think that is an un unimpeachable uh, property that, that you would want to have. The second property is we want our uh, functional to be called sub-additive. We want it to respect diversification. So the cost of writing a portfolio of X plus Y should be less than or e equal to the cost of writing X on a standalone basis plus the cost of writing Y on a standalone basis. And the argument here is that um, the, the risk load is reflecting capital costs. 
if you pull two risks together, there's the possibility that a good outcome in one can offset a bad outcome in the other. And so you get a more efficient um, use of capital across the pool than you would have on a standalone basis. And this is not quite as um, unimpeachable as monotone, but I think makes, you know, actuaries would agree this makes a lot of sense that you want a sub additive uh, pricing measure. It also, from a risk management perspective, allows you to manage risk by unit. If you've controlled rho of X and rho of Y, then you've controlled the risk of the total, which is good. And as is well known, value at risk does not have this uh, property, but tail value at risk does. Thirdly, though, Thinking about subadditivity, so we're, we're arguing that subadditivity exists because uh, we can have a diversification benefit economizing in capital usage. The flip side of that is we don't want to allow credit if there is no diversification. Okay. Now, it's a, it took a while to figure out what, what does it mean to say there's no diversification between X and Y? Does it mean you know, they're, they're perfectly correlated? Um, you know, what, what is the appropriate uh, measure? Now, perfectly correlated would make sense, but it only measures linear uh, association. And we, we want to allow nonlinear associations too. So it turns out that the correct uh, idea of no diversification is that if X and Y imply the same event ordering, meaning the largest outcome of X occurs on the same event as the largest outcome of Y, and then the second largest with the second largest, the third largest with the third largest, and so forth. So they imply the same event order. In that case, there's no way that you can have diversification of one against the other, and we want our pricing uh, functional then to be additive. We want the price of X plus Y to equal the price of X plus the price of Y. And then finally, we want our functional to be law invariant, uh, we want our price only to depend on the distribution of X. Um, and this goes back to the idea that insurance risk is diversifiable. So there is no market state out there that you would be worried about correlation with because everything uh, diversifies away. So this uh, is an assumption that is, is, leads to what are called classical premium calculation principles in the actuarial literature. Uh, if it's law invariant, it's called a classical uh, PCP. And it rules out, note, note having a categorical by-line cost of capital that, that is solely associated with X because of the line of X. Because you, you can have the cost of capital varying as a result of different distributions by line, but not solely because of the label of the line that they have, because that would not be a law invariant uh, function. So we have these uh, a, a through D. So we, we want to define a class of, of uh, risk measures of pricing functionals that satisfy A through D. And we're going to call those uh, spectral risk measures. Um, and so the first thing to note here is that uh, tail value at risk is an example which satisfies A through D. So there are risk measures that, that do this. Uh, another thing that you should note is you might be wondering, well, how does this relate to coherent? Um, well, co-monotonic additive um, implies uh, both translation uh, invariance and positive homogeneity because um, X is comonotonic with itself. So rho of 2X is twice rho of X. Uh, and then you can bootstrap that to positive homogeneous. And everything is comonotonic with a constant. So rho of X plus a constant is uh, rho of X plus rho of the constant. And then it's normalized because it's positive homogeneous. So if you satisfy A through D, you're automatically coherent. And also because of C, if, you're, if you replace B with convex and think about convex risk measures, um, convex plus positive homogeneous is subadditive. So actually that would also be a um, coherent risk measure as well. So we're going to define the class of spectral risk measures to be those uh, that satisfy axioms A through D. And this is a, a very, very nice class of uh, risk measures and functionals. And one of the ways you see that is it has a lot of different representations. So there's four in particular. Um, you can represent something that satisfies A through D as a weighted average of values of risk where the weights increase. And by weighted average, I always mean weights are between zero and one and they sum or integrate to one. Uh, two, you can represent it as an arbitrary weighted average of, of tail value at risks. So in particular, you see there that T var is, a, is an SRM because that just picks out one T var as the weight uh, of one. Thirdly, you can represent it as the worst over a set of probability scenarios. So the maximum of the expected value of X times Z for some Z that's positive 
uh, and integrates to one that gives you a sort of probability adjustment. And fourthly, as a distorted expected value. So that is a functional uh, that depends on a increasing and concave g function g. And it's given by the integral of g of s of x dx, where s of x is our survival function, the probability that big X is greater than or equal to x. Now, hopefully you all remember that the integral of the survival function is the expected value. Um, increasing concave g's um, take, are, have the property that g of s is greater than s. So what this integral is doing is it's fattening up the tail and it's going to result in something um, that has a higher mean um, than uh, the objective. And then we can apply integration by parts here uh, to convert integral g s to the integral of x times g prime s f of x and get the expectation um, expression uh, on the right there. And that allows us to automatically think about allocating this uh, because if our big X is a sum of little of big X i, so we've got a, a decomposition of X into by line, by unit, what have you, I'm always going to call them units, um, then it's a very natural thing to think of allocating uh, e of xi times this risk adjustment g prime s of x. Notice that there's x in the s second uh, term there. Uh, and that will give us a, a linear allocation of the total because the expectation operator is, is linear. So we call this the natural operation, natural allocation because of uh, Freddie Delbain uh, pointed out that this was a, a very natural thing to do in his, uh, in his PISA notes. So let me describe the distortion function a little more. Remember, this was an increasing and uh, concave function. So the left-hand graph shows a, a plot. The solid line would be a function g. Uh, increasing is obvious. Concave means it, it's sort of bowed down. Its slope is uh, decreasing. It has to start at 0, 0, um, because there's no, pros no cost to ensure something that's impossible. And it ends at 1, 1, because there's no markup on a, on a certain loss. Um, because it's concave, it has to lie above the diagonal, so it's adding a positive margin. Um, and you can prove, uh, Asabi actually proved this 2002, that having g be increasing is equivalent to the um, distortion operator um, being monotone, and having g be concave is equivalent to the distortion operator being subadditive. So this is how we get the requirements on g. And the interpretation of G is it's the ask price to ensure a Bernoulli 0-1 risk with a probability S of taking a loss. Okay, so um, Bernoulli, you know, the only outcomes are 0 and 1. Uh, probability of no loss is 1 minus S. Probability of loss is, is S. So it's the price of that very simple binary all or nothing uh, insurance policy. The chart on the right shows... Um, how we can we can get a standard uh, insurance uh, terms here. So the loss is, is the distance from S up to the diagonal. So here we're looking at S at about 0.3. G of S is the premium. <coughs> so the margin is G of S minus S. And to write this policy, you would need assets of one. So the capital is going to be one minus the premium, uh, one minus G of S. And then it was uh, Gary Venter had the idea of taking these layer views and using them to add up to price any bigger risk. And this is what Sean Wang picked up in his uh, premium density papers as well. So the picture on the left shows the dotted line you can regard as the outcomes of X. It's actually the quantile plot of X uh, over probability values from zero to one. So the left end is the, the lowest outcomes. The right end one would be the, the worst outcomes. We show a level X there. Um, if you have an insurance policy that pays one, if your loss is greater than X is a sort of deductible and it pays just one, so it's one of those Bernoulli uh, random variables, then the layer loss is going to be one minus P labeled to the right. Then we're going to apply G to that one minus P uh, to get the margin. And the solid line is then going to be the graph, sort of transposed graph of <clears throat> G of S of X. And then one minus G is going to be the capital. So those three pieces uh, correspond to what we saw on the previous page. So that does one layer. And then if we just integrate that from zero up to A, uh, we would get the total uh, expected loss as the light gray shaded area in the middle plot, 
the margin as the dark area, and then the total capital required as the white area at the top. And the right-hand plot just shows these amounts on an expected basis. <clears throat> now, let's talk about allocation. So thus far, we've been talking about uh, totals. We did introduce the natural allocation with the risk adjustment. But now let's think about allocating this total portfolio premium uh, down to the individual units. And there are two ways to do this, uh, which we call uh, the marginal method and then the natural method. So the marginal method is, is a classical microeconomic approach, right? How, how does the competitive firm decide what to write? It writes until marginal cost equals marginal revenue. So thinking in terms of marginal cost is a, is a very natural uh, way to, to proceed. Uh, for a positive homogeneous functional, you get the Euler allocation that's uh, well known. Uh, we've got uh, Biller and Heath's uh, axiomatic cost allocation gives essentially the same thing, the Ullman shapley extensions. This is a cost allocation, so it's taking the insurer's perspective. It doesn't really care about uh, what the insured might think. And again, if we've assumed constant cost of capital uh, and cost of capital is our only expense, uh, we've taken all the other expenses off the table, then cost really, cost allocation and capital allocation become one and the same thing. And this sort of leads us to the Tasha, again, EVA, uh, Glenn Myers, Maya Reed uh, approaches <coughs> to pricing uh, with capital allocation. On the other hand, we've got the natural allocation. This is uh, intuitive and consistent with modern finance. It works through risk adjusted probabilities. And our risk adjustment is given by this G prime S of X. And this is going to apply that to the actual cash flows that the insured receives. So it's benefit based and it's taking to some degree the insured's uh, perspective. In the US, this is sometimes known as the co-measure approach. Um, and you know, to figure this out, you have to know, for example, if you've got a limited liability insurance company, you must know what the payments are in default because you have to apply this functional to the actual amounts that each individual insured is going to achieve. And so you can immediately see from that that these two allocations cannot be equal because one of them depends on how the payments are allocated in default and the other one doesn't. This was actually a bit of a surprise when John and I were working on this. He was taking the marginal cost view. I was taking the natural view. We did all our algebra. <clears throat> and you get, you know, it, it's quite a sort of different route of calculation that you go through. And I expected the answers to be the same because it didn't appear to me that either of us had made any assumptions. Um, but in fact, um, I had made an assumption about how default was, uh, how your payments were allocated in default. So we got, we got a ever so slightly different answer. It only varies obviously in the default states. So that's an unsatisfactory set of situations, right? You've got two very nice ways of thinking about allocating capital, but they're not the same. Uh, but coming to the rescue, there's a wonderful result, Freddie Delbane uh, theorem. He, he actually called it a proposition in, in his paper. So this was in the Peter notes on coherent risk measures. And he says that the marginal allocation equals the natural allocation if there is a unique density Z so that rho of X is the risk adjusted expected value of X. So the expected value of X times Z. In that case, the marginal allocation equals the natural allocation. And that is just the best situation to be in because you've got these two very nice uh, allocation methods and you would be very worried if they were different. And we're, we're saying, okay, no, in, in these situations, they're the same. The situation where we've got a unique density. Now we know we always have Z as G prime S of X as one density available to us such that rho of X is E of X C. So really the question is, are there any others? And the answer is no, if and only if the quantile function of X is increasing, which means that X defines a unique ordering on events because there are no situations where you've got a range of uh, probability levels where the quantiles are the same that you can't differentiate. So if you've got a unique ordering on events, then um, you get uh, the, the marginal allocation equals the natural allocation. Now we can see that if we illustrate this for, for T-var. Um, so let's think about T-var at the p-probability thre p, p threshold. And let's think about a risk X shown in the top left plot there, which has a flat spot chosen to deliberately span P. So from P minus to P plus, 
the outcomes x are a constant. Now, what is t-bar? t-bar is the conditional average of the worst proportion 1 minus p of outcomes. So the, what is the worst proportion 1 minus p of outcomes? Well, there's some ambiguity there. It obviously includes all of the outcomes from p plus to 1. They're all in, in the worst group. But we can choose any subset of the range from p minus to p plus with probability equal to p plus minus p. So we, we want that proportion of that flat spot. We can choose that in any way. So we could choose it, for example, in the bizarre way in the middle plot there with the, the, the wiggly line. We could choose uh, to weight uh, those outcomes um, in that way. It would give us the right answer for the total. But if you imagine you're then trying to apply that risk adjustment function to allocations, just because x is flat doesn't mean all the components of x are flat. You could have offsetting situations with the, the units that add up to a constant, and you would get different answers for the natural allocation. And the bottom we show, there's two kind of obvious ways that you can address this. One is on the left, what's called the linear uh, allocation. We could just say, well, we know how much probability we need to spread across this flat spot. We'll just do it evenly. So we will weight all of the outcomes between P minus and P plus equally. And that will give us a, a unique way of, um, a sort of canonical way of, of weighting those outcomes. The other way, which we call the, the lifted uh, approach, is this. So often when you've got a flat spot on your distribution X, it's because it is net of some reinsurance. And the reinsurance, for example, you've got an aggregate stop, will produce you a bunch of outcomes that all have the same um, uh, outcome where the reinsurance attaches. But in that case, you've got the gross distribution, and the gross distribution often is does have an increasing quantile function. So you can use the gross distribution to order your outcomes, and then you can pick. Uh, it gives you a canonical way of picking uh, out of the flat spot on the net which ones you would choose. And so that would give you a, a contact function or a Z as we show on the, the lower right there. So this is two ways of dealing with the situation when uh, marginal does not equal uh, natural. And in both cases, um, what's actually going on here is that if the marginal doesn't equal the natural, then actually the marginal doesn't really exist because you're trying to differentiate a function which is not differentiable. You're in a situation like we we're illustrating here. So rho is a, is a convex function of the underlying variables x. And if you imagine a point like x star there, if you take the derivative from the left or the derivative from the right, you get different answers. So when there isn't a unique natural allocation, there actually isn't a unique marginal allocation really either. And actuaries um, see that as uh, order matters, right? They, they know if I've got this portfolio, if I write more of one line or the other, or if I bring the risks in in a different order, I get different answers. That is a manifestation of the fact that they're trying to differentiate a function that's not differentiable. And so whether you do it from the left or the right uh, matters. Um, now, we also have seen here that, that sort of a sign that something is, is awry is that um, the natural allocation depends on the default rules. So it makes it seem as though the default rules matter. That's not quite correct. What actually matters is simply the fact that there's a possibility of default. So default matters. And because we're working with uh, the limited losses, the minimum of x and a, and if the probability that your you default is positive, then the distribution that you're actually pricing has a flat spot. Okay, so in that case, we're going to know marginal does not equal uh, natural. So I would regard this this Delbane as you know this is the best possible answer to a paper that that Venter Major and Krebs wrote in in Aston in 2006 about uh, decomposition and marginal risk measures. It really uh, gives the, the full answer to it. It applies to homogeneous and inhomogeneous portfolios. So um, homogeneous sort of asset-like portfolios were considered, for example, uh, Sinakis and, and Barnett and IME 2003. Um, but this works, this logic works for uh, inhomogeneous uh, portfolios as well. And this is what I meant when I said modern finance provides a satisfying theoretical uh, pricing model but it doesn't quite work in practice because in practice you're always going to be in that situation of limited liability and you're always going to be dealing with a, a distribution that has some flat spots in. So you have to make a choice between what well, you have a, a function that's not actually differentiable. All right, so now let, let's carry on and think about practice and, and allocations. So to apply a spectral risk measure, we've got to address two questions. Firstly, we've got to deal with this non-uniqueness problem. 
And here there's no definitive answer, but the linear and the lifted allocations give us two very reasonable approaches that we can try. And then secondly, obviously, we've got to determine the distortion function. Gee, we haven't talked about that at all. And we can think about doing this uh, directly and indirectly. So estimating it directly, we go back to the interpretation. G of S is the ask price on a Bernoulli risk with a probability S of taking a, a, a loss of one. And the comparables that are obvious for us to look at here would be corporate bonds, and particularly corporate bonds issued by insurance companies, uh, and catastrophe bonds, which I would note are actually a perfect example of the entity we're trying to uh, price here, right? They come into existence at a time with no existing assets, very finite lifetime. They've basically got no expenses, no taxes, no regulation, and then claims are settled at the end. So they're, they're a wonderful sort of experiment for, for our pricing. So catastrophe bonds. So on the right here, we've got some uh, pricing for catastrophe bonds. We've got expected loss on the uh, x-axis and the spread that's paid, which is the, the G of S uh, on the, the y-axis. And you can see you know, the right-hand plot shows on a log-log scale. So you can see it looks like, uh, for example, there's a minimum rate online uh, kind of effect going on. And it, you, know, you could certainly draw a range of uh, increasing concave uh, functions through there. Um, but the big thing, we, the, the middle plot, I should say, is, is it zooms into uh, just S between 0 and 0.25. The big problem we've got is there's no data here for S greater than 0.2. We have no, nothing in the sort of equity range uh, that we can point to and say this is an appropriate return, for example, for, for a 50-50 probability of loss. So the second method is, is inferring G indirectly. And what I want to do here is to determine uh, the set I'm going to call pi, which is the set of spectral risk measures that price our given risk, maybe we're thinking about the growth on our portfolio, to a set premium P. So we go back and we think about spectral risk measures. We, we know that they are a weighted average of tail values at risk. And so a SRM corresponds to a probability measure, probability function, on the real numbers between 0 or 1 that gives us the weights uh, that we apply to each uh, t-bar. And that's a very nice, that probability space is a very nice space. It in inherits all the nice spaces of the, the features of the space of real numbers between 0 and 1. Uh, it's a bit complicated, it's a bit big. Let's just try and make it a bit tamer by picking a few individual p's and just thinking about what weighted average of the t-bars on those p's uh, would give us the premium. Um, so we could pick four here. Um, I want to pick T var one, which is the, the maximum loss, T var zero at the bottom there, which is the expected loss. Um, if the premium lies between the mean and the maximum, which it will in oh, any, any sensible situation, then you can solve for a unique P star so that T var P star of X is equal to the premium we're looking at. So let's take that as the third one. And then let's just take some other p uh, there to the left that I want actually to be less than p star. So these are four probability levels, 0, 1, p star, and p. And the tetrahedron is representing the weights, right? So the weights that we're going to apply to these um, add up to one non-negative number. So it's, just, you, you know, it's, it's like a triangle in the um, x, y, z axis, only it's, it's four-dimensional. And what is going to be the locus of the set of weights so that the weighted average of the relevant t-vars equals p? Well, it's going to be the sum of the weights times the known t-vars for x equals a constant. That's going to give, determine a hyperplane in the weights. And we can look and see where that hyperplane intersects with this tetrahedron. That's going to give us all of the spectral risk measures that price x to p. So it's going to be this shaded area. Uh, triangle that I'm showing here. By construction, it's going to go through T var P star because the weight there will be 100% to that uh, T var, that price is X to P by construction. And then it's going to slice the other edges um, somewhere between. So like, for example, on the front here, we get the constant cost of capital we know is that weighted average of V times expected plus D times uh, the maximum, so we actually know what the weights are there, and we know where that point is going to be uh, on the front that's labeled CCLC. If we take any other P, um, we, we take any other edge, then if 
one uh, probability is uh, greater than p star and one is less than p star, you're going to have two t-vars, one is greater than the premium, one is less than the premium, you can find a weighted average of those two that equals the premium. So that's the uh, situation that we've got on the left here with t-var 1p. Um, since t-var p is um, less than the premium, there's no weighted average of t-var p in the expected uh, that equals the premium. So there's no intersection with the bottom um, edge there of this uh, tetrahedron. So we get a sort of nice schematic, and this, this is obviously a four-dimensional picture of a, you know infinite dimensional thing in, in real life, uh, but we get a very nice picture that we can schematically draw as follows. We've, we've got a nice convex set that is equal to our set, set pi. The extreme points or the vertices of that are these bi t-vars, so weighted average of two t-vars, other than the t-var p star. That's the only one that only weights one uh, t-var level. All the other ones are, are two t-vars. And within here, um, every single spectral risk measure that weights, uh, that prices the premium to p is a weighted average of these vertices. So you might have known about things like the proportional hazard transform or the Wang transform, the dual transform. Uh, we talk in the book about a blended transform, which starts to look at bond pricing to parameterize the small s and then it extrapolates from that. And I've drawn these sort of top to bottom uh, because as we're going to see, the constant cost of capital model is going to be the most tail centric, the most sensitive to tail risk. And the TVAR P star is going to be the most body centric. So just sort of keep that in mind, it's going to come up uh, down the road. Now, this uh, is going to be a pretty big space. We're going to have quite a few uh, functionals in here. We're really trying to hone in on G. Just knowing the price of X isn't really going to get us there. We would like to add, uh, in addition to the fact that rho prices x at p, some other constraints on, and whether you think about rho or g is, is equivalent, you've got a, a dictionary obviously between the two. So we might, for example, want to require that g of s is always less than 1, so we get an equivalent measure. That's a, something that in finance you don't like changing the, the sets uh, that are possible or impossible. Uh, we might want our functional to reproduce known bond yields or cap bond yields uh, for small s, and we might want some particular minimum rate online behavior. And if we overlay these things, uh, we would get a subset of pi of the risk measures that not only priced x to p, but satisfied these other um, observable um, requirements. And that could result in a substantial, well, it will result in a substantial reduction in the size of p. And this is what I meant when I talked about a parameterized to financing and strategic decisions, as well as premium. Now I want to end by introducing a case study. The, the QR code here will take you to a website that has all of the exhibits uh, from the book and much more detail about this case study. Uh, there's there's two other case studies we look at, but this one is a, a nice middle ground. It's a blend of a, a cat line of business and a non-cat line of business. The non-cat is written as a, a gamma distribution with a mean of 80 and a coefficient of variation of 15%. The cat is a log normal with a mean of 20 and a CV of one, so quite a thick tail distribution. We're assuming that the two are independent. That's just for convenience, it's not necessary for the math. Uh, the total is a, has a mean of 100 and a CV of about 23%, which isn't a fairly reasonable for a smaller uh, insurance company. We're gonna work with a 99.9% uh, value at risk asset requirement, which uh, works out to be 267.2. And we're gonna calibrate our pricing to 115.15, which is exactly the 10% um, cost of capital pricing at uh, that cap, that asset level. Plot on the right just shows you a bivariate scatter plot and you can see quite clearly that the risk is all on the cat side on the y axis, the x axis showing the non cat line is very, uh, very constrained. Now in using our set pi, uh, we can actually figure out where when we plot a distortion function where it must live. So if we plotted every single distortion function that corresponded to all the risk measures that priced x to 115.15, they would live in this shaded area uh, that we show on the left. And in the middle plot, we show two, I've, I've drawn in there two um, different uh, distributions. We've got the blue is the constant cost of capital. So that is 
uh, a, the, um, this line here, okay, so it goes from D, and D is going to be uh, 0.1 over 1.1, straight line up to, up to 1 here. And this has the most expensive tail capital as S gets smaller and smaller. It's not obviously you can see there is there's capital that's more expensive for any given small S, but uniformly this has the most expensive capital of uh, any of the distortions that price X to P. On the other hand, I've also shown the T var P star function, and that is this orange function here that goes up. It actually is, is about T var of about uh, a half, so that's why you can see the hits, hits one at about a half here. This has the most expensive body capital in the sense that the, the spreads here are as high as they can possibly be for non-tail events here. So as S goes towards one, on, remember um, S is the probability of exceedance, so a probability of exceedance of 0.8 is a, is a small loss. The tail losses are at this end. Now, it's still relatively um, costly to insure tail here, right? You've got a substantial markup from the, the diagonal, but it is the cheapest in the tail um, and the most expensive in the body. And that's why I drew the picture of the schematic that I had earlier. That's why I drew it the way I did with CCLC at the top and tail var p star at the bottom. The distortion envelope allows us to make inferences about new risks. So if I have a new risk Y, then it's a fact, uh, this is a result I proved in a paper just published in the IME, that the extreme values of rho of Y for rho in the set of measures that price X to P occur at those edge uh, extreme by T var points. And that means they're easy to compute because we can do an approximation to pi, we pick a few uh, p's, we can compute all the by t bars, and then we only have to look at the value of how each of those by t bars prices y to figure out what the range of possible values of this new portfolio is that are consistent with pricing our existing portfolio to p. And if we use the subset, we, we could, uh, you know, we can have subsetted uh, pi down to also require the financing is consistent with. Uh, cap bonds and what have you, but we can compute these amounts. So an obvious application of this is let's evaluate the benefit of reinsurance and let's take Y to be the net portfolio after we've applied some reinsurance to our cat non cat portfolio. And let's apply cover of uh, 80x of 41 in the aggregate to the cat line. Um, that is uh, 80 and 41 are determined as, as uh, occurrence um, PML points off the cat line. Um, the book here describes this as an occurrence cover, unfortunately, that is a typo, it, it is an aggregate um, cover. If we do that, what we find is that the minimum net premium we get is 105.90, and it occurs at the constant cost of capital uh, risk measure. And that's expected because what does the reinsurance do? It makes the tail thinner. Which risk measure is most sensitive to tail risk? Constant cost of capital. So it's going to give you the greatest reduction, the greatest benefit from buying this reinsurance. The maximum net premium, on the other hand, is 110.88, and that occurs at our T var P star, which is the most body centric and is the cheapest in the tail. So that is going to say, all right, yeah, you're making the tail thinner, and I'll give you a little bit of credit for that, but I'm also concerned about the body. And kind of by making the tail thinner, you, you accentuate the, uh, the impact of the body. And so it gives you much less uh, of a credit. So if an executive was considering whether to buy this reinsurance or not, their decision would be, well, I, I, it's going to lower my cost of net funding somewhere between 427, which is the difference between the gross premium of 115.15 uh, minus the 110 is the 427, up to 9. 25 for the cost of capital. So it's quite a range. In this case, the seeded loss to this contract would be 222. And so this would correspond to having a seeded loss ratio of somewhere between uh, 24 and 52%. Now that's a very relevant range because if you look at cap uh, pricing, a contract like this would probably be priced to a loss ratio in the 30s. <clears throat> and so this uncertainty 
between my break even, you know, my buy decision loss ratio lying between 24 and 50. Obviously, it's a broad range, but it's a very relevant range because your broker who brought you this contract would probably be pitching it with a, you know, a seeded loss ratio of let's say sort of, you know, 35%. So the graph on the right here uh, just shows the average loss ratio on U.S. wind exposed cap bonds from 97 to 2020. You can see, you know, since HIM in 2017, the pricing has gone up a lot. The loss ratios have come down, uh, but they're all above that uh, in recent years, above the blue line there, which is at the 24% level. So depending on the executive's view, the um, range of outcomes from here we get from the uncertainty around do I care just about tail or do I care about tail and body is actually material for making this risk decision. So you can turn that around and you can look at the decisions that people make and you can use that to make inferences around the uh, rows that they're actually using to price and then you can drive consistent risk uh, decision making throughout the organization once you've determined what that role should be. So conclusions, uh, I offer four conclusions from this. The first is that these spectral risk measures are, they're a wonderful tool, uh, they're practical, um, they can be allocated in a very nice way. Um, when the allocation is difficult, it, 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 you understand why that is, it's because you've got these flat spots, you've got ties, which any actually working in this space will have, have, have met this sort of reordering uh, problem. Uh, but they're underspecified as a, as a pricing tool. You not a unique uh, SRM that you can uh, parameterize if you just know pricing, but you can explicitly quantify um, a range of reasonable SRMs and you can overlay both uh, insurance premium and financing decisions to make that as tight as possible. Um, this gives you a firm level G that you can regard as encoding the investor's view of the business and the management. If you try and raise capital and you go out into the markets, you know, your investors will all want to know, well, who's going to manage this? Because one of the reasons insurance capital is expensive is that insurance entities are very opaque and their um, investors have to trust management. And so the firm's G is picking up in part uh, the trust that uh, investors have in that company. And you see that with the different sort of price to book. Uh, ratios that different companies run according to their profitability. And then finally, the G influences your risk appetite. And as we just saw, uh, influences things like reinsurance decisions, depending on which G you're choosing. It's very much a, a relevant uh, and material uh, number. It's, it's right in the range that you're going to um, have to make decisions around um, whether to buy reinsurance or not, or whether to, to <clears throat> write catastrophe exposed business or not. So I hope you found that uh, helpful. This is obviously just scratching the surface of the topics that we uh, cover in the book. I would encourage you to go to Amazon, get a copy and uh, read some more of the details at there. Thank you very much.